What comes to your mind when you hear the word insurance? Expensive. I think most people think it's useless. Complicated. A few things I'm not going to say on here, but what, let's call it a necessary evil. Let's see. Coverages, co-pays. I think it's stability and reassurance. All the payments. Boring. Scammers. How do you know what kind of insurance you actually need? I mostly look for what's convenient, uh, accessible, affordable. That's the biggest thing is being able to get a plan that I can afford and know it's I'm covered. I don't know. I guess the big ones, you know, health, house. You have to do your due diligence. You have to look, you have to look around. You have to read, find out what they offer. I think you just have to look at what you're, what you have that you need to protect. If I'm owning a home, I'm going to need homeowner's insurance. Uh, depends on where I live. You know, if I live maybe down by the river or something like that, I may need some flood insurance. There's a lot of options. I guess that can be confusing. I think most people would probably think it's pretty complex and they're probably just not educated on it. United States, you got to have insurance to have good health care, so. Life happens, bad things happen. You don't want it until you need it, and then, then it's too late. So insurance is very important for, to protect yourself and others and, and support your family. Things happen, and it can take a, a huge hunk of your savings. Even the dog has insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got employed, it was like, and this is what you need. Yeah. <laughs> and this is what you need. There's no classes in college for that. Insurance is not to make you wealthy. Insurance is there to protect the things that are gonna make you wealthy. And insurance is a pain. It's a pain because there's insurance for everything. You can get insurance for a hangnail. You can get insurance for anything. It's crazy out there. And the problem is half of it we don't understand and we feel like we need all of it and we, we end up buying the wrong things and, and we just sense that somehow insurance is everywhere. And, and I, you know, it's the thing we all love to hate because we don't understand it, we feel like it takes a lot of money, and we don't really feel like we're, we're really getting any traction with it, and it's really because in most cases we're not. So I'm the guy that doesn't sell insurance. I've had all the licenses, I've had all the letters after my name, I dropped all the licenses so that I can tell you the truth. And if anybody wants to gripe, they'll just have to gripe. And they do, believe me. Because insurance people, some of them love this lesson because they're the people that sell the right kinds of things and some of them really don't like Dave Ramsey. <laughs> and you know what? If they start selling the right stuff to help you, then they'll be on my team and I'll be okay. If they're selling the wrong stuff and they don't like me, I'm okay with them not liking me. I'm perfectly comfortable with that. It's kind of a gift. <laughs> so most people hate insurance for those reasons, but it's part of a good defensive game plan. Now let's look at understanding insurance. The purpose of insurance, very simply, is to transfer risk. Now there's two kinds of risks that you're going to face. There's the risk of things that you can absorb yourself. You don't need insurance for a flat tire. You have an emergency fund to fix a flat tire. That's a risk you can handle, a small enough risk. You do need insurance if you total the whole car because that's a big risk. You do need insurance if a big medical event occurs, but if you've got the flu, you can pay that one. And so we transfer risk in a good defensive game plan that we can't handle ourselves. The risk that we can handle ourselves, we save that money and don't pay it out in insurance premiums. You only pay insurance premiums on the risks you can't handle yourself. Without proper insurance, certain losses can bankrupt you. And you don't want to leave yourself exposed. That's your defensive mechanism here. It's your defensive game plan. You don't want to leave your family, your future, all your hard work, all the, all the struggle you've done to build up some stuff, and now one thing takes it out. No, not if you've got the right kinds of insurance in place. Now, the basic types of insurance, most of us know those, and we're going to talk through those, and we're going to talk through some of the gimmick ones and what not to do as well. Homeowners or renters insurance, of course, auto insurance, of course, health insurance, most of us know we need that, disability insurance, long-term care insurance, identity theft protection in the world we live in today, and of course, life insurance. So let's begin to break those down and look at them. We'll start with auto insurance. If you have a full emergency fund with your auto insurance, raise your deductible. Think 
high deductibles. Rich people think high deductibles. Higher deductibles means lower premiums. I'm paying out less because I'm taking some of the risk. And you can afford to do that if you have baby step three done, your fully funded emergency fund of three to six months of expenses. Now, higher deductibles are not always worth the money. So you have to do a little bit of math. It's called a break-even analysis. Here's how it works. Let's pretend on your auto insurance you had a $250 deductible and we were going to price out raising it to a $1,000 deductible. Well, that means you're going to take an extra $750 in risk. Got it? Say yes. yes. Now, if that's the case and they come back and they say, hey, we're going to cut your premiums by $75. Well, we've taken $750 worth of risk for $75 a year in savings. $750 divided by 75 is 10 years we've got to go without anything happening and hitting this deductible. Do you see how I did that? Say yes. yes. Okay, and, and, and that's too long, so we probably wouldn't do that one on an auto insurance situation. You're probably gonna get some kind of a bump or a ding or something in a 10 year period of time. So that's too long. But let's say it saved you $150 a year. Well, now you got a five year break even, right? Into 750. So that's probably one we start to look at. So you say, how long, how much risk am I taking versus what am I saving? And how long have I gotta go without an event occurring? And that tells you whether raising your deductible is going to be a good buy or not. Always carry adequate or even over adequate liability. Liability in homeowners insurance and auto insurance is the best buy. Personal liability is the best buy in all of insurance. And so people try to go, come along, they want to take a $150,000 liability. No, 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 no. Minimum of 500000 Minimum of 500000 Because if you get in a bad enough wreck that there's $100,000 involved, they're not coming after you for 100,000. They're coming after you for a million. And so that's a bad wreck. That's a bad situation that something's happened. And people don't fool around for $100,000 in lawsuits in those situations. So go ahead and take that half a million and price out the difference in the 150 and the half million liability. You'll find it's very, very little. So that means after watching this lesson or attending this lesson, you got to go back right now and check your liability and make sure it's high enough because that's the best buy. It's gonna be just a few dollars more to have the proper level of liability. You can consider, if your cars are paid for, dropping the collision. Now, years ago, this used to be a lot more popular, but honestly, collision, now collision is when you tear up your car. That's not when you tear up somebody else's car. When you wreck your car fixing your car, that's your collision, right? And honestly, competitive rates have caused that to be very affordable now, and even though I can afford to self-insure me tearing up my own car, for the coverage I get for what I pay, I'll go ahead and buy it in most cases. Now, if you, if you don't have your emergency fund, you gotta cover the car. Otherwise, you're gonna be walking, all right? So even if you're driving a hoopty, you get hoopty insurance, right? <laughs> now, it, when it comes to homeowners and renters insurance, homeowners coverage has changed dramatically in the last couple of decades. Years ago, we used to have guaranteed replacement cost insurance. And homeowners coverage should be guaranteed replacement cost if at all possible. Very, very hard to find on homes under $500,000 these days. After several hurricane hits and other things, the, the insurance companies figured out a way that they could get their profits up and that was by not covering everything. And what they do is now they cover the amount that they say and, and it's called extended replacement cost insurance. And so that if you get a $200,000 home and you buy $200,000 worth of insurance, they'll extend it only so far above that. So you buy the home for $200,000. You come back a few years later, the thing's worth $500,000. You never really fixed your insurance. You just kept paying it and it burns down. You don't have five hundred dollars in coverage. You got two hundred dollars in coverage plus whatever extension they've given you. The maximum is about 50%. And so that $200,000 home probably has $300,000 maximum in coverage unless you've gone back with your insurance agent and raised it and kept it updated. So you can end up without full coverage because of the way these new policies are written. So I'm really not a fan of them, but that's mainly what's out there on homes under a half million. Now, if you're a renter and you're in an apartment or renting a home or something like that, you need renter's insurance. Insurance. This is contents insurance. 
It covers your stuff that's in the rental property in case of a fire, in case of a, a weather event, or in case of theft. It's very inexpensive. A couple of hundred bucks in most areas, about $20,000 worth of coverage. So if you're a, a newlywed couple or something like that, get renter's insurance. Get renter's insurance because you'll come home, that front door will be swinging, somebody kicked it open, took all your stuff out of there, and you got nothing because you wouldn't pay 14 bucks a month. Get renter's insurance. As a landlord, I own a bunch of rental property, and many, many years ago, I had some rental property, and one of the saddest things I'll never forget was we had this, this nice little brick house. It wasn't anything fancy, but there was a guy in there. There was a hardworking guy living there, and they lived there about three months, and I got a call one night, and, and the thing was on fire. And, and I went over there, and of course, the family got out safe. Everybody was safe, thank goodness. And um, the next morning, we're going over there. It's a total loss. All their stuff's burned. My house is burned down. It was just a, you know, fire's a really sad thing anyway. And I'll never forget standing in the front yard with that guy, and he's really having a hard day, obviously. And he says, so Dave, when are we going to get our check for our furniture? I said, uh, you're not unless you have renter's insurance. Well, as a landlord, you have to cover our stuff. I said, no, not in any state. As a matter of fact, not only do I not have to, I can't because I don't own your stuff, so I don't have what's called an insurable interest in your stuff, so I can't insure your things. And I watched as it dawned on him that I really was telling the truth and all of his stuff was gone. And I will never forget that man's face when someone's talking about renter's insurance. Always have renter's insurance. An umbrella policy, an umbrella liability policy is a great buy once you begin to build some wealth. Once you begin to get some things moving where you've got, a, you've got some retirement, you've got some mutual funds, you've got some equity in your home and some things like that, now you want to start to get even more liability. Now remember, we set a half a million dollar limit on your homeowners, a half a million dollar limit over here on your auto, and the liability umbrella attaches to the top of that and you can add another million in coverage, another $1 million in liability coverage for in most states somewhere around $200 to $300 a year. Very, very inexpensive and a great buy for those of you that have already done well. But later on, remember, if you're starting to do well, go ahead and get that. Because again, a couple of hundred bucks and you got another million dollars in coverage. It's a very, very good idea. Health insurance, the number one cause of bankruptcy in North America today is not credit cards. They are number two. Number one is health insurance or a lack of health insurance coverage. Health insurance coverage with great big deductibles and 80-20 copays and no emergency fund is usually what it is. Medical bills, number one cause of bankruptcy. And it's not people that are uninsured as much as you would think. It's people that have insurance and have a huge event and they didn't have good coverage. They didn't understand their coverage and what was going on. So let's look at it for a second. 69% of U.S. workers have something paid by their employer towards health insurance at the time we're taping this video. Of course, that's up in the air. There's a lot of politics around the issue of health insurance, a lot of things going on. So always check our website for updates. We can always tell you what's going on. We'll, we'll have the latest and greatest info. We're cutting edge folks, and you can always go online for tools there and keep, keep up to date with everything that's going on. With health insurance, the same thing applies. You increase your deductible and or your coinsurance amount to get your premiums down. I'm trying to cause you to not pay all your money out on insurance premiums and only cover the big stuff. We're going to cover the little stuff with the emergency fund and with the budget because we're going to use our money to do that. So a $250 deductible, if you are paying for some or all of your own health insurance, is not affordable for most families anymore. What you've got to be real careful with there is you can go ahead and raise that deductible up to 1000 Most of those policies have what's called an 80-20 copay, which means after that $1,000 deductible that, of course, the insurance company is going to pay 80% of everything after that, and you're going to pay 20% of everything after that. But let's keep in mind what that looks like. If it's a $100,000 event, that means you're going to have $21,000 out of pocket. Your $1,000 deductible plus your 20% of the hundred grand. You have $21,000 out of pocket on a $100,000 event. And you and I know you can go to the hospital and run up 100000 just like that. 
So you need to think about, this is where this emergency fund comes into play, and you think about how you're facing these different things. Now, you can increase your stop loss as well. Now, stop loss is after a certain amount out of your pocket, they pick up everything. Some of those PPOs I'm talking about might have a $10,000 stop loss. And so it's $1,000 deductible, 80, 20 until 10,000 is out of your pocket. It's your out of pocket, then they pick up 100% after that. So learn what your stop loss is. I will tell you, that's one I wouldn't tinker with. I'll tinker with the deductible and raise it. I wouldn't mess with the stop loss. You can even tinker on some policies with the 80-20 and do a 70-30, which means you're accepting 30% of the risk there. But again, you gotta add up what that's gonna amount to and what is the savings you get for that. If it's just a few dollars, I'm gonna let them take that extra risk. But if, if it really chops my health insurance, my health insurance is driving me into the poor house and I can really chop it by going 70-30 and our family's pretty healthy, maybe we need to look at that. So stop loss is one I really wouldn't mess with, but you need to know what it is. Now, the other thing you don't wanna do is you never decrease your maximum pay, their maximum pay. The insurance company will have a, an amount that says after a million dollars, we're out. Or after a half million dollars, we're out. You never decrease that down in order to save. That's the end we're trying to cover. The little stuff you're covering, we're letting them cover the big stuff. And so we don't take their million dollar and they're out or their two million dollar and they're out and decrease it down to save. That's not the way to save. Leave that one alone. So never decrease the maximum pay which is the, what the insurance company has to, is obligated to pay maximum. So if you get into a thing where you've got twins in a NICU unit and you run up through a million dollars, which can happen, then, then you, you know, they're going to keep paying all the way up through there. But if you cut that down to a half a million, you can bust through that number pretty quick in a situation like that. And all of a sudden you're on the hook for three or 400 grand. This situation is bankrupted most people then. And so you want that maximum pay to be on them. Now, see if an HSA, a health savings account, would make sense for your specific situation. The HSA works like this. I love the HSA. I have an HSA on me. I offer three plans through our company for our team members, one PPO and two HSA option, options. That's how much I think of this plan. Now, the HSA is, is called the health savings account. And the way it works is this, very high deductible, and then it pays 100%. And it's about two-thirds as much. So if you, if you, on a PPO, if you'd be paying $500, your HSA is probably going to be about $300 a month. It's going to save you that much in premiums. But it's not a $1,000 deductible. It's a $5,000 deductible. But after $5,000, it pays 100%. It's not 80-20. So here's the way that works. If you're pretty healthy, that's a great deal for you. If all you're doing is doing the occasional flu, going to the doc kind of thing and that kind of stuff, or if you're really, really sick because you're going to blow through the 5,000 real quick and then 100% after that, and it's going to make, and you only paid 300 bucks instead of 500 bucks a month for it. So it's going to make a lot of sense if you're healthy or you're real sick. In the middle, it's not so good because you can, you know, you can get up there in that three, four thousand dollar range burning through that deductible and that two hundred dollar difference between three hundred premiums and five hundred premiums doesn't cover that difference, you see? So you want the deductible, you, you want to understand with the HSA, you got the big deductible, smaller premiums and a hundred percent payout. And then the other thing you're allowed to do then is you're allowed to save up to your deductible into a savings account every year called a health savings account. The amount of money you put in there is tax deductible. So it's like a health insurance IRA, if you will, called an HSA. And so while we saved 200 bucks on the premiums, we took more risk on the deductible and we can throw money over here and create a tax deduction up to $5,000 or up to the deductible plan that you sign up for. So you get a tax deduction and you can use that money in that savings account anytime to cover medical expenses. So if you chunk your deductible in there pretty quick, you can cover the whole. It's kind of like a beefed up emergency fund that the government caused you to not pay taxes on. Then you're saving money big time on your premiums. And that's been the net result to us. And we've actually never even used the savings account portion of it to, to pay bills with. We just let it build up. 
So I've got like an extra $5,000 a year I can stick over there and keep taxes off of it and let it grow. And then we're just, you know, we pay for the pediatrician or we pay for the dermatologist or whatever, you know, that we go to. So again, the HSA is a great plan for families that are pretty healthy and doing pretty well. If you got kind of chronic stuff going on, probably not gonna work so well for you. The HSA is a tax-sheltered savings account for medical expenses that works with a high deductible insurance policy. It creates a 100% tax deduction on the amount you put in there. Now let's look at disability insurance. Disability insurance is designed to replace income lost due to a short-term or a permanent disability. Now one more time, we are not covering the little things tonight. We're covering the big things. Say big things. Big things. Short-term disability is a little thing. You're off from work for three months because something happened, that's a little thing. You can figure out a way to work through that stuff, so don't buy short-term disability. We're buying only long-term disability, permanent disability. I'm unable to work because of whatever happened. And that's the one that scares you. And let me tell you, that's the biggest risk we're gonna talk about tonight, and most people think it's not. I was reading a survey the other day in one of the insurance magazines and it said that when surveyed, 2% of Americans thought that they would ever face a disability, a permanent disability during their life. And the truth is, 30% will face a permanent disability of some kind, either partial or complete disability. One third of Americans will face that. And, only two, and people think only 2% will. So this is a big deal. Long-term disability insurance is the most underinsured area in a financial plan. I don't worry about dying. I'll be in heaven and Sharon will have a big pile of money. I worry about disability because I'll take a huge income cut and I still got to figure out a way to do whatever I'm doing at that point. Disability is the toughest area to cover. Get long-term disability. It is absolutely absolutely necessary. 20-year-olds have a one in four chance of becoming disabled. I was doing a book signing a while back and a young man came up to me, 28 years old, and he said, I just want to tell you thank you. And I said, for what? what? What's the situation? He got this real serious look and he said, well, I've got, and he named this name of whatever he's got this long. I don't know what it was. I'm not a medical person. And he said, it has, it has completely drained me. I'm completely unable to work and I have been declared permanently disabled. I'm 28 years old, I made $100,000 a year. And he said, because I went through Financial Peace University, the next week after, I went, after your role of insurance lesson, I went and got long-term disability insurance, I have an income for the rest of my life of $65,000 a year to replace my $100,000 income. And I got two little kids to raise, and I'm gonna be able to do that because of this class. Thank you so much for making me go do that. So I wanted to tell you his story so that some of you do that. Some of you watching this video, go do that right now. You check long-term disability insurance. Now, disability insurance is based more on your occupation than it is based on your age. Life insurance, health insurance, those kinds of things are based more on your age or your health, right? But if you're in a blue-collar setting where you're handling power equipment and that kind of a thing, it's gonna be a lot more expensive for disability insurance than if you fly a desk for a living. Right? And so you, you, you gotta know what you're facing when you go into that. The best place to get long-term disability insurance is at work. If you can buy it through work, it's gonna be the cheapest there that it's gonna be anywhere. The next best place would be through, through some kind of a trade organization or something like that. Maybe you're a home builder. The Home Builders Association might have a policy available through the association. That's usually gonna be cheaper than the open market. With any kind of insurance, as you're shopping it, you wanna find an independent insurance broker. This is one that doesn't work for one brand. And they'll shop all the brands, except for the guys who work for one brand, they'll shop all the brands and get you the best price on what's out there, and they're not married to one particular company. Those are called captive agents when they're with one company. So when you're shopping your disability, do it that way. But you're best off to get it through work. You're second best through some kind of a trade association or something you belong to, whatever it is, you can find it that way. And then lastly, just in the open market. So again, it's gonna be based on what you do as much as it is your age. And so like if you're a high-rise window washer, you just can't get it. You don't need it anyway, it's the life insurance you need. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. So try to buy disability insurance that pays if you cannot perform the job that you were educated or trained to do. That's called occupational or own oc disability. Now, this is not available in the open market much anymore for your whole life, but it's available usually for the first two years. Let me explain that. If, if I became disabled and couldn't do my job, since I'm on the radio and speak for a living, that would be losing my voice. I might be completely able-bodied, except for my voice, and I wouldn't be able to do my job. Agreed? Say yes. yes. Okay, so my own occupation would be denied to me due to the disability. I have own oc disability for two years. So it will pay for two years due to the lost voice. After that, it's not going to pay. Get a job, Dave. That's what they're saying. All right? Uh, do something, even though you can't talk. And for some, many people, they would consider that a blessing. So, um, <laughs> but, but I used to have own oc back in the day for your whole life. It's very difficult to get that. Most of them limit own oc for two years. After that, now, if I was totally disabled, say, you know, a car wreck and I was in a wheelchair or something like that, then I would get it no matter what because I would be completely permanently disabled not just not able to do my job. That's the difference. So try to look for own oc because that allows you to time to quote unquote get back on your feet and, and you know get back into your job or arrange another career track to get on depending on the type of disability that you face. But really study this stuff, really get into it. It's very, very important to do that. Now beware of short-term policies covering less than five years. A lot of those are sold as gimmicks at work and there's no point in buying those. By the way, when you buy your long-term disability at work, always buy it with after-tax income. This is the only thing you'll ever hear me say that on, so listen careful. Everything else I want you to buy with pre-tax income. I want you to do your 401k pre-tax. I want to do all of that as much as I can. You buy your disability after tax because if you buy it before tax and you become disabled, your disability check is taxed. If you buy it with after-tax dollars, it's tax-free coming in. So always buy disability with after-tax dollars. Now, your coverage should be around 65% of your old income. So if you make $100,000 a year, they ought to cover about $65,000. Now, some policies will only cover 50% of your old income. The most I've seen in a long time is around 70%. So, but really, you think about it. After they take out Social Security... After they take out income taxes, your 100,000 looks a lot like 70 anyway. So you're still basically got full coverage at that point. Now, a longer elimination period will lower your premium cost. Now, the elimination period in disability is your deductible. From the time you're declared disabled by the doctor, officially disabled until you get your check is the elimination period, not from the time the event occurred. From the time the doctor says, Dave is disabled, when do I start getting my checks? Most policies are a 90-day period of time. That's your deductible. You have a 90-day elimination period. If you want a cheaper disability policy, take 180-day, a six-month elimination period, a bigger deductible. For me, I would go ahead and take the big deductible because I've got investments over here. I can make it six months. It's not six months I'm worried about. It's 25 years. The little stuff we cover, the big stuff they cover. Keep your premiums down. Always be thinking that way. Long-term care insurance. Long-term care insurance is for nursing home, assisted living facilities, or in-home care. Now, this is an absolute must if you're 60 years old or older. How many of you in the room are over 60 years old? If you are healthy enough, get long-term care insurance now. How many of you have parents that are living that are over 60 years old? Okay. You need to sit down with them and have the talk about long-term care insurance. Because the biggest thing facing your generation, the biggest expense facing your generation is not your kid's college. It's your parents' nursing home. And when you get hit by kid's college from one side and parents' nursing home from the other side, we are starting to call you the sandwich generation. And, and it's, it's, it is hammering families. Get 
long-term care insurance when you're 60. Don't buy it till you're 60. It's useless. You have a less than 1% chance spending time in a nursing home before 60 years old. I wouldn't buy it at all. But the day you turn 60, buy yourself a birthday present, long-term care insurance, right then. And make sure of this, because here's what happens. 75% of you ladies will outlive your husbands. 75% of the ladies outlive their husbands. So we build up a nest egg of three, dollars $400,000. And, you know, we're up here at 60, 70 years old. And, 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 you know, Pop gets sick and Pop goes in the nursing home. Nursing home's 50 to 80 grand a year. I mean, we're taking the money out of that 400 grand pretty quick. It goes away. Pop lives just long enough to completely bankrupt the nest egg. And then he dies and leaves mom penniless in good health. You don't want to do that. That's the typical scenario. So make sure mom's taken care of is mostly what it is to get these things done. So have the talk with mom and dad. And it's difficult to have a money talk with mom and dad because you're facing what we call the powdered butt syndrome. <laughs> Once someone has powdered your butt, they don't want your opinion about money or sex. <laughs> but you get to sit down anyway because guess who's gonna have to pick this up? You may even have to pay for the long-term care insurance to make sure they're okay. Well, the government will take care of them. We'll just move all the stuff out of their name. And then they'll qualify for Medicaid. How many times have you heard that one? We, moved, we put mama's house in our name so, so that mama could qualify for Medicaid. Well, did your mom spend her whole life on food stamps? And why are you trying to get her qualified for welfare now? Medicaid nursing home is a welfare program for poor people. And, and let me help you with this. Moving assets out of someone's name in order to participate in a government welfare program is called fraud and they are investigating it, and they will prosecute you. They'll look back three years and undo some things. Other things, they'll look back as far as five, even 10 years, and see if you're moving things around to falsely qualify for welfare. Government-provided nursing homes are done for poor people. They're not done for people who have a house with $800,000 worth of equity and just don't want to pay for it. That's fraud. And that's the way the government looks at it. And they look at it that way because it's fraud. <laughs> so, I think the saddest story on the long-term care insurance I've run into in a long time is I was talking to a buddy of mine a while back that's 65 years old at the time. His wife was 68. And he called me up and he was having a fit because somebody was trying to talk him into buying long-term care insurance. And I talked to him for a long time, about 30 minutes, trying to convince him, because he just hates insurance people. You ever met somebody that just hate all insurance people, you know? Just run them off with a gun, you know, or whatever, every time they come around. And he's just like, well, I'm not buying this stuff, it's just a rip-off. And I said, it's not a rip-off, it's financial planning. This is risk you need to transfer. And I kept talking to him about the statistics that, you know, it, it's amazing. The last six months of your life, your medical care, Call, it is the most expensive six months of your entire life. It may be more expensive than any entire decade that you've had. It, it, the last six months of someone's life is unbelievably expensive. And, and I just kept hammering him with all these numbers and trying to convince him. And, and I thought I got him, but he got off the phone. He never went and bought it. A year later, his wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And she's in really good health. Translation for those of you that never dealt with Alzheimer's, she's going to live 10 to 12 years. Most of those years, he's not going to be able to provide her care. His unwillingness to pay a few dollars in that premium is going to cost him hundreds of thousands of dollars. That was at least a half a million dollar mistake for him. At least. And, and it wasn't a radio call. This is, I took 20 minutes with this guy trying to talk him into it. Couldn't do it, but it's sad. And he had the assets, he had the money, so he ended up writing the checks for her care. Very, very sad situation. Identity theft protection. Now, most of us know by now that identity theft is a huge problem out there. People losing our numbers, people stealing laptops with all kinds of numbers on them, whether they're social security numbers and they steal your medical records or whether they steal your credit. Identity theft of all kinds is really, really rampant out there. Almost 10 million people last year had their identity stolen. It's just a big, big problem. 
And so when it comes to identity theft insurance, how do we do that? It's not technically an insurance product. It's technically a protection product, minor detail. But what you need to do is you need to not buy, don't buy identity theft protection that only provides credit report monitoring. You can do that yourself. You can order a copy of your credit bureau for free. That's not a big deal. It's not hard to do at all. And so you can monitor it yourself. You don't have to pay somebody to do that. What you do want is you want good protection, and good protection includes restoration services that assign a counselor to clean up the mess. And the problem with identity theft is not that you owe money because you don't owe money. Someone steals your checkbook and writes a bunch of checks. You don't, those checks aren't good. You didn't sign them. You're not liable for them. That money can't be taken out of your account. You're not liable when someone signs your name falsely. But the problem is you have to spend an average of 600 hours cleaning up the mess and convincing all of these companies that it really wasn't you with police reports and affidavits and all this. So get a counselor, get a protection plan where a caseworker is assigned to your case and does all of that work for you. That's the kind of identity theft protection I bought on me and I bought it for my whole family and I even bought it for my whole team. That's how big a deal it is because I don't want my team distracted with something like that. I want them working. <laughs> Life insurance. Life insurance is to replace lost income due to death. It's really death insurance, but that's not very good marketing. 30% <laughs> of the households in America today have no life insurance. Absolutely crazy as inexpensive as term insurance is. Most people that have life insurance have no idea what they own. They bought it from an old friend at school. They bought it from a relative who is now no longer in the business. 80% of the people in the life insurance business are gone within two years. They go do something else and you're stuck with whatever they sold you and your old buddy from college or whatever got you into it. And you don't even know what you own. Most people have no idea. There's basically two types of life insurance. There's term life insurance that's for a sp specified period it's substantially cheaper and has no savings plan built into it. It's for a term. That's why they call it term life insurance. It's a five-year term plan for a five-year term or a 10-year or a 20-year or a 30-year. It's for a set term. Cash value insurance is normally for life, for your whole life. One type of cash value insurance is called whole life life insurance. And it's more expensive because it funds a savings program. As a matter of fact, it's a lot more expensive and funds a savings program. There's several types of cash value life insurance. There's whole life life insurance, which is the old fashioned kind. Then they came along with universal life insurance and then variable universal life or VLs or VULs, variable life or variable universal life. If you hear anything like that, anytime you hear saving money inside of an insurance policy, that's a cash value type policy. Now the most common insurance myth is that that the need for insurance is a permanent situation. The only permanent situation in the world of life insurance is your agent's permanent need for commissions. <laughs> that's the only thing permanent in there. Now let's look for a couple. I need a couple that's about, say, 30 years old, uh, something like that. There's one. You guys. Okay, stand up, guys. What's your all's names? I'm Keith. Keith, good to meet you. Shauna. Shauna, good to meet you. And how old are you guys? 36. 29. 36 and 29. Okay, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to make you 30. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> and, and I'm going to do damage. I'm going to make you 30, okay? So we've got a, sweet, a great 30-year-old couple. Do y'all have kids? We do. And, and what ages? Uh, Three-year-old. Three-year-old? And, and a one-and-a-half-year-old. And a one-and-a-half. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so what happens in the life insurance world is, is they want us to think we need to keep life insurance for our whole life. And so we need to buy insurance for the whole thing all the way out there. But let's take this couple right here. They're 30 years old. Let's pretend for a second that we bought 20 years of level term insurance on them. Now let's visit them 20 years from now. She's not quite 50. And, and he, he, he's 50. Okay. <laughs> and, and the babies were one and a half and three. three so they're 21 and a half, almost through the senior year of college and 23 out of college, 
and their parents have been through Financial Peace University, so the kids know how to handle money, so they're gone. <laughs> they're not in the basement, right? <laughs> and so the kids are grown and gone. Now, we teach you to never take more than a 15-year mortgage. Have you heard that? Say yes. yes. Okay, so in 20 years, would they have a mortgage? No. Would they have any debt? No. Oh, no, because debt snowball long ago would have knocked it out, right? And in the retirement and college planning lesson, we're going to teach you Roth IRAs and 401ks, and you're going to be investing and saving money because you're out of debt. You're going to have money to invest. Your most powerful wealth-building tool is your income. Can you imagine in 20 years that the typical couple with the typical household income would have $700,000 to a $1 million in their retirement plan? I can show you those numbers. Did you believe that? Yes. Okay, now let's visit them. They're 50 years old. The kids are grown and gone, they have no mortgage, and there's a million dollars in mutual funds. Something happens to poor Keith. You think Shauna's going to be all right? I think she's in great shape. See, by getting out of, well, except for that part. <laughs> Aww. We're speaking financially, Keith. Okay. You will be missed, but okay. <laughs> So, what the deal is, is this. By getting out of debt and building wealth, their need for insurance has gone away. They've become self-insured because they've got the wealth to supply her needs. And so, this idea that you always have to have insurance is a concoction dreamed up by the insurance companies that sell insurance. So, their need for insurance is going to go away. Now, my need for insurance years ago went away. But Sharon still wants me to buy some, and so we do. We call it SWI, Sharon wants it. <laughs> so thanks, guys. Have a seat. So that's the idea. If you do good financial planning, your need for insurance starts to dissipate by getting rid of the debts and raising your wealth. Now, if you're not going to do the stuff that we teach in here, then you're not going to do the stuff that we teach in here. So people try to cherry pick, and they go, well, that won't work. Well, it does work when you put it into the whole picture it does work. So let, let's look at this for just a little bit. Well, let's, let's pretend that we'll use Keith and Shauna, or we might even change Keith's name to Joe because that's what I put on the slide up here. So <laughs> let, let, let's pretend we've got a 30-year-old and we wanted to go buy some whole life cash value life insurance, and we wanted to buy $250,000 on Keith or Joe. And if we did that, it would be $178 a month right now. That's according to research our firm just did with the top five whole life life insurance companies out there. A $250,000 policy on a 30-year-old Keith would be, or a 30-year-old Joe would be $178 a month. Now, what happens is, is that over time, it builds up inside of it this savings program called cash value. Have you ever heard of that? Say yes. Yes. Now, the actual averages of the top five companies are that at age 50, that Joe would have $34,000 cash value in there. That if he wanted to cash the policy out, they would hand him that. He's got a savings element to this as well. And of course, at age 70, he wanted to retire. He could cash it out. He'd have $124,000 there set aside. Now, that's pretty cool. And that's the way they sell it. You pay that your whole life. And, and at the end of your life, you got some savings. If you die, you've got coverage. And that's basically the way it's sold. They talk about this owning a house where term insurance is renting. And that's how the whole life life insurance agents sell this stuff. Now, let's instead look for a second at a better idea. Let's say that we wanted to buy $250,000 worth of 20-year level term on Keith or on Joe. At 30 years old, that would be $13 a month for the same amount of life insurance instead of $178 a month. See what I meant by it's more expensive? Which means if I'm gonna spend 178, I've got 165 left over to put into something else. Let's put that in a Roth IRA, way away from life insurance people, in a good growth stock mutual fund over here. And let's see what happens. Ends up 164,000, not 34,000 at age 50. Ends up almost $2 million versus 124,000 at age 70. Now let's see. $2 million, 125,000. Pick the big number. <laughs> I'm spending $178 both ways. I got the same insurance and I got a bazillion more dollars. But here's the big deal. Here's the reason this is the biggest ripoff since the payday loan. Payday lenders take advantage of the lower class. 
Whole life life insurance is the payday lender of the middle class. Here's the problem. Let's say that we're trucking along there with the whole life life insurance paying $178 for $250,000 worth of coverage. At age 50, there's 34,000 in savings and we paid extra to get that. We see that now very clearly because we could have bought that amount of insurance for $13. So we know we've paid to build this and we can actually run a rate of return and we'll find out then that that, that 34,000 is based on about a 3% rate of return, which is a lousy rate of return on the long haul. Here's the biggest problem with the whole thing though, the ripoff of ripoffs. If something happens, he dies, they're gonna send his beneficiary $250,000. What happened to the 34,000 he's been saving up all this time? They keep it. So you have a savings account with a horrible rate of return and when you die, they keep your money. This is stupid. And yet it's sold like crazy. You know why it's sold like crazy? Because insurance agents are paid on premium. Their commission is calculated based on the premium. What do you want to sell if you're pay selling premium? 178 or 13? They sell the big one. Let's go all the way to the best and see what happens. Let, let's see what really happens here. Let, let, let's get $500,000 worth of coverage. Because he, see, here's the situation with Keith down here. She, Shauna's got two little babies, right? Something happens to Keith. She doesn't need 250,000. That'll be gone just like that, won't it? We need to replace his income. If that's an average family, they're probably above average, but if that's an average family, then they make about, he makes about $50,000 a year. And if you had 10 times your income on you or 500,000, we give Shauna 500,000 if something happens to Keith. And then guess what? She can invest that at 10%. If she made 10% rate of return on her investment, well, 10% of 500,000 is 50,000. Keith, I'm sorry, you've just been replaced. <laughs> and you don't want to get too much because then you have to sleep with one eye open. <laughs> so the best thing you can do is let's go ahead and get the proper amount of coverage so that little family's taken care of if something happens. Get that half million. It's only $21 a month. That lowers the amount out of our $178 formula that we've got, so our investments are a little less, but we still got almost $2 million versus $125,000 at retirement with what we didn't spend on rip-off cash value insurance. And that's what we're facing here. So never buy cash value insurance. It is not a good idea. People buy this stuff as an investment. It is not a good investment. We've just proven that. We've just broken it down for you very clearly. I don't own any of it. I've never sold any of it. I can't stand the stuff. Term life insurance is the only life insurance that you should buy. Now, why not use life insurance for investments? We just walked through it. Let's walk through it one more time. The returns are historically low. When you die, with cash value, the insurance keeps the cash value. Well, with variable life, you make a little more on that, Dave. That's going into mutual funds. They showed me the mutual funds. They're earning 12 or 13%. Yes, they're earning that, but the net payout to you is never anywhere near that on your cash value growth in a variable life. Because what happens in a variable life is anytime you walk anything down the hallway of a life insurance company, its pocket gets picked while it's going. Because they're going to fee, 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 fee. It looks like a French poodle. There's so many fees. <laughs> and, and by the time they do that, your net rate of return is very, very, very low. So the fees are deducted from your return are extremely high, thus creating a low return. Variable universal lives are averaging net return to the consumer less than 7%. Whole life is averaging between 2 and 4%. Lousy rates of return on long-term investments. Don't do it. Well, I'm going to understand this so I can sit down and explain it to my insurance agent. Why? All you do with your insurance agent, if they sold you this stuff, is just practice two words. You're fired. Well, he's my brother-in-law. All the more reason. You're fired. See, you're, you're not going to win an argument with those people. If you win the argument, they have to quit doing what they're doing. They have to quit their job. So there's no point in arguing with them. It's not gonna serve any purpose. Just get your term insurance in place and drop that garbage. 
and don't drop it until you got the term insurance in place. Money Magazine, Fortune Magazine, Kiplinger's, Consumer Reports, My Calculator all say cash value is the most expensive and least, least useful form of life insurance. Smart Money Magazine said it this way. They said the right type of insurance can be summed up in a single word, term. These are all the financial magazines. Everyone in the financial world hates this stuff except the people that sell it. The only proponents of it are the ones that sell it. Everyone else, all the experts, anybody who can run a calculator runs from this garbage. So life insurance, what do we buy? Well, you need about 10 times your income on you. Like we said, it makes 50,000, we're gonna put about 500,000 on Keith or Joe, right? So if you make 60,000, about 600,000. And don't forget your spouse. No, I mean, don't forget to insure your spouse. <laughs> so in other words, the stay-at-home mom, does she provide an economic value? You bet. Try replacing her if something happened to her. You gotta hire Mary Poppins to do all this stuff, right? <laughs> and so you're gonna need 250 to 400,000 on a stay-at-home mom, somewhere in there to replace the lost economic benefit of her. Is she worth more than that? Oh, light years more than that, but at least get 250 to 400K on her. Children only need enough for burial expenses. You don't buy life insurance on children. They don't make money, they cost money. Now, if you have a little starlet that goes to Hollywood and makes you about a billion dollars, then insure that little puppy. <laughs> but most of our kids cost us money. They don't make us money. They're a liability, financially speaking. So all you need there is enough to cover, God forbid, burial expenses. Make sure you have a new policy in place before you cancel any of your old whole life. Never cancel life insurance, old life insurance, until you have the new in your hand. Don't get in too big a hurry because you don't want to get one foot on the boat and one on the dock and the boat leaves. You will be wet. That's not a good plan. Insurance to avoid. Credit, life, and disability insurance. Sometimes when you buy something on credit, they want to put life insurance on there. And it gets humorous sometimes. I actually was counseling a guy one time, had financed his rototiller for his garden. <laughs> and he bought insurance to make sure the debt was paid off if he died. <laughs> he didn't have much life insurance, but the rototiller was gonna be paid for. <laughs> this stuff is hugely expensive. It's sometimes 50 to 100 times the cost of term. You just saw what we could buy for $13 up there, right? And we figured out that for what he was spending on his rototiller insurance, if he'd taken that same amount of life insurance money and bought term life insurance, he could have bought a $100,000 policy. Instead, he was covering about 5,000 bucks. So it's somewhere around 20, 25 times too expensive. Disability insurance on debt is the same thing. You buy your insurance over here. And believe me, the lenders love to sell insurance. The banks love to sell insurance. And if the bank is selling insurance, it's expensive. You run. You always go to your insurance broker and let them shop and get you the best deal. You're not gonna get a good deal from a lender on insurance. Well, we won't approve the loan unless you buy insurance. They cannot force you to buy it from them. They cannot turn the loan down because you didn't buy insurance from them, except in the auto industry, everyone else. But any of the, anyway, we're not borrowing money, so we're not worried about that. Cancer and hospital indemnity policies. Cancer is not the number one cause of death, but it is the number one gimmick we insure for. Now, if you've had cancer, you know it's not a gimmick, but the insurance stuff around it is a racket. Because here's the deal, your health insurance policy covers cancer. Why are they not selling heart attack insurance? Some of them are now, but, but here's the deal. Your health insurance is supposed to cover that. You don't need to buy it again. That you're duplicating coverages and well, if you got cancer, things are really bad. Yeah, they are. That's why you have a big honking emergency fund. You've got your investments going over here. You're out of debt and you have health insurance. And then you've got what it takes to fight cancer and from an insurance perspective. Don't be nickel and dime to death on these gimmick policies. They're out there everywhere. Accidental death. I get twice as much if I die by accident. You're not getting anything. You're gonna be dead. <laughs> and guess what? Shona doesn't need twice as much if he dies by accident as if he dies regular. He's just dead. You don't need double if you're dead by accident. 
You know, again, a gimmick. Well, it doesn't cost much, so I just put it on there. Hint, insurance companies are really good at math. If it doesn't cost much, it's because it doesn't cover much. That's how, oh, it's only $3. There's a reason. Don't be nickel and dime to death. It's crazy. No pun intended. Prepaid burial insurance. Prepaid burial policies, period. I had a guy call me on the air a while back. His mother had just passed away, and he'd gone through this horrible thing, and they, in their emotions, they had overpaid big time uh, on mama's funeral. And so he went in three weeks later, determined that wasn't going to happen to his family, and paid for his funeral, 40 years old. I said, are you sick? He said, no. I just didn't want that to happen to my family. I said, well, I appreciate that sentiment. What did you pay? $3,000, and it's for my whole life. It doesn't matter. When I die, I'm covered. I said, I bet. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, let's take $3,000 and put it in a mutual fund in my calculator right here, and let's understand that if you're 40 years old and you're not sick, actuarial tables, life insurance tables will tell us you will live to beyond 80 years old on average. Average death, male age is 74, female 76, but that includes infant mortality. So once you make it to 40, you got a real good shot making it into 80s and 90s, statistically speaking. So let, let's run the numbers out then. Think about what happens. 3,000 bucks invested from age 40 to age 80 in a mutual fund. $355,000 in this account. Who are you, King Tut? <laughs> so don't pre-buy stuff like that. You can pre-plan, pre-arrange, pre-select but don't pay for it. Have an account over here making a whole lot more than they're going to pay you on that account. And then, you know, your relatives can spend $8,000 or $10,000 or $20,000 out of the $355,000 coffin mutual fund. <laughs> and I think they're going to come out pretty good. Mortgage life insurance, another gimmick. And again, a very emotional thing, kind of like the cancer thing. Well, at least the house will be paid for. The only time you buy mortgage life insurance is if you're uninsurable. If you've been sick and you can't get life insurance, you can do a lot of mortgage life without a medical. And without the medical, that's a good way to at least get some insurance. But otherwise, don't buy this stuff. It's 10 times more expensive, and all it is is term insurance that goes down as your balance goes down. It's decreasing term. And so you don't buy mortgage life insurance. 10 times more term for the same money Going to a good website and searching among companies and getting you a good deal. Much, much better idea. And don't buy policies with big-time fancy options and all this. Watch for the bells and whistles. Accidental death, we talked about that. Here's another one, return of premium. Lots of life insurance policies offer return of premium now. Lots of long-term care policies offer return of premium. Return of premium is if you go so many years paying the premiums and you never use the policy, we'll give you all the premiums back if you pay just this little bit extra for this return of premium feature. Take the little bit extra, put it in an investment, and you'll have a whole lot more when you return your own premiums. Don't fall for these gimmicks. Waiver of premium, in the event of disability, I'm not gonna have to pay the $13. I think we're going to self-insure through that baby. We only insure the big stuff. We don't insure the little stuff. Little stuff is where they make all their money. Big stuff is where we transfer risk. That's our defensive game plan. The last thing I want to talk to you about is you got to have a will. 78% of Americans die without a will. This is ridiculous. Get a written will. And I recommend you put a legacy drawer in your home. That's what we call it. In the study in my office is a file drawer. In that drawer are the wills, the life insurance policies, the disability policies, the car titles, all the real estate information. Everything financially about my life is in there and instructions on each one, who to call, how to handle things. If something happens to me, Sharon can walk in there and it's all in one place. She's not trying to find it and dig it up out of the backyard and all this other stuff. <laughs> that is one way I say I love you to Sharon Ramsey is our life is prepared that way. That is diligence, diligence. And the Bible says the diligent prosper. So be diligent in these areas. Be wise in these areas. Now be sure you're doing your budget. And people ask me all the time, Dave, where's term insurance in the baby steps? Where's electricity in the baby steps? Where's food in the baby steps? 
Where's your rent in the baby steps? It's not there. It's a budgeted item. You have to have a budget that includes taking care of your life, and that includes health insurance, long-term disability insurance, term life insurance, and you make, you know, your car insurance, your homeowner's insurance. You probably already have those two. So go adjust those deductibles, polish up your plan, get yourself squared around where you're right, where you need to be on all these things. Let me tell you what happens. When all of that stuff is real clean and that legacy drawer is there, there's a place in you that relaxes and you're able to turn and become more productive in your life. You start getting a different layer to financial peace because you never know what's gonna happen. Scott and I met at Maine Maritime Academy, which is one of the Merchant Marine Academies. We moved all the way out in Texas two weeks after we got back from our honeymoon. It was very exciting. We did a lot of traveling. We went down into the Caribbean. Our last trip that we took was to Paris. That was our thing. We, we were very adventurous. We wanted to experience those things with each other. That's why we got married so young. and and experienced so much. I was the one who brought the debt, primarily. I had $80,000 in student loans. And then shortly after our marriage, we did the typical, you know, just graduated college. Scott got a truck and then I got a car. And that brought us up to $120,000 in total debt. It took us two years, you know, to dig ourselves out of that hole, but we just wanted to create that long-term legacy for us and our family. In January 2017 is when we found out we were pregnant. We needed to get life insurance, especially because of the fields that we worked in. You know, everybody tells you how exciting it is to have a baby, but you don't really understand the magnitude of it until you do. Two weeks after Sullivan was born, we had a beautiful Sunday. Uh, we got up and had a nice brunch. It was beautiful. We had a very nice time. We came home and gave Sullivan a bath, and it was his first bath, and laid Sullivan down for bed. I got a shower, came down. We had just sat down on the couch. I made some popcorn. About 10 minutes into the movie, I felt a pressure on my arm, like Scott was leaning into me. And our relationship was very comedic, so I thought he was trying to annoy me. I'm like, what are you doing? It only took a moment for me to say, okay, what's going on? And I looked over at him, and he was just rigid. I kind of went into emergency response mode. You know, you're on the ship and they train you for medical emergencies and I kind of just went into autopilot. I was on the phone with 911. I got him down on the floor. I did CPR on him until the paramedics came. From where I was sitting, I could see the clock on the stove and I just kept looking back at the stove and I knew that it was taking too long. All these things were running through my mind, but I never once thought that he was going to die. I kept saying in my mind, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? We'd been together for nine years. He, you know, he was my first boyfriend, and he was my last boyfriend. He was my husband. He was... I'm sitting here with a brand new baby and my world just fell apart. And the only thing that I can do is to focus on the financial part of it because at least that's one less thing to worry about. I'm 27 years old. I am not supposed to be filling out paperwork for a life insurance claim on my husband. None of this is easy, but from a financial perspective, it makes this a lot easier because I don't have to worry about what Scott would want because he told me what he wanted. Hi, baby. How are you today? 
Are you taking care of your mom? Well, I'm at work. I'm still thinking about you and your mom. Just remember I love you and stay healthy and I'll see you soon. Love you. I am so thankful that we did those preparations, that we had those conversations because we have the life insurance. I'm able to stay home with Sullivan and take care of him, which is what he needs right now. And I'm able to do that because of the preparation that we did. So as you can see, insurance is really important. It can be confusing. Sometimes we hate it, but we know we need it. Teams that win have a good offense and a good defense. Boxers that win keep their guard up with a good defense and create an offense. People who handle money well, who win with their money, do the same thing. They have a good defense and a good offense. Insurance protects you. It's there to transfer risk from you to the insurance company to give you peace of mind in areas that you can't afford to take the hit. You keep your guard up. It's that simple. Now, go check out your policies and use our coverage checkup tool with your Financial Peace membership and make sure you got the right things in place. The next lesson is all about investing. Yeah, you've been wanting to do that, but if you just do investing with no guard up, you'll get your block knocked off, so don't do this. Time to start walking you through how to really build some wealth. And this is where you learn the practical information on investing and you start planning. So don't miss this next lesson. It's how you're gonna create the legacy. It's kind of so that I got out of debt so that I could do this. This is the so that lesson. Don't miss this. It's a fun lesson. Now it's time for your one minute takeaway. Write down the one thing you're gonna do this week because of what you learned in this lesson. <laughs> 